A student of mine, Sophia, shared with me that she kept hearing this phrase, you never asked. And it kept coming up in conversations with people that she thought she knew really well, friends of hers. But she would find out something new about them, and she would turn to them and say, how did I not know that about you? And they would say to her, well, how would you? You never asked. And it came to a point where she was sitting down in a conversation with her stepmom's uncle. And her stepmom's uncle was regularly over at their house and around their family over the years. To the point, she said, honestly, where she grew a little bit of an annoyance of how much he was around. Until one day she was sitting there in conversation with him. And he began to open up and share about how earlier on in his life, he had lost twin babies that died at childbirth. And then merely months later, he lost his fiance to cancer. And with tears in her eyes, she looked up at him and said, how did I not know that about you? And he said, well, how would you? You never asked. He said, being around your family has been like the chance to be around the family that I never had the opportunity to have. And in an instant, her perspective, her attitude towards this uncle changed. And she went from a place of annoyance to a place of compassion and understanding. Now, these, this notion of unheard and untold stories is not a new revelation. In the 1800s, poet and professor Henry Longfellow said that if we knew the secret history of our enemies' lives... We would find so much suffering that it would disarm all hostility and instead produce compassion. That made me think about this. I was really convicted by that quote. To think, what if we lived in a world where we moved from being certain about people to having curiosity about people? Where we shifted from jumping to conclusions about people to jumping into people's stories? What if we shifted from this place of annoyance to this place of compassion. And it caused me to think, how can I get my students to engage in these kinds of conversations, to hear a little bit of the secret history of their family, their friends, and their roommates' lives, and experience a bit of a taste of this shift from annoyance to compassion, from certainty to uncertainty, and to curiosity. And that's when, four years ago, I developed uh, an assignment called Low Point Conversations. And this assignment of Low Point Conversations asked them to have three of these conversations that are just that, where it's an opportunity to sit down with somebody and explore a low point that they've been through in their life. Explore a little bit of the secret history of a season of this person's pain and suffering. And they could do so by thinking about someone that they had a relationship with that was appropriate for that kind of a conversation and then merely find the right time and the right place for it. And then I armed them with a few follow-up questions to allow the conversation to flow. Things like, tell me a little bit more about that. Can you give me an example of that? How did that make you feel? And I said, you can approach it just like this, with those three people that came to mind. Approach them and say, hey, in this class I was given this task and this challenge of having three low-point conversations with people. And when I was given this task, your name was one of the first ones that popped into my head. That we've had a great relationship and lots of great conversations, but I don't know that I've ever genuinely heard about a low point that you've been through in your life. Would you mind sitting down with me and sharing what that might be for you? And I could do the same in return. Now, occasionally students will, will ask, well, what if we throw that out there and they don't have a low point experience to share? And I said, if they have a pulse, they have a low point. That's what makes us human. That's what reminds us that we're in this thing together. Because over four years, this assignment has now sparked over a thousand low-point conversations. And each semester, as I read the reflections from these students, I constantly see things. Like, I've known this person for two years, and I had no idea they dealt with this. I've known this person for four years, and I had no idea they dealt with that. I've known this person for eight years, and I had no idea. Dia, tragic things that are really intimate to these people's lives of, of eating disorders, depression, siblings going off to jail, 
parents dying in drunk driving accidents, abortions, miscarriages, close family members and friends dying of cancer. You name it, I've read about it. And I want to share a couple of these low-point conversations with you that I've had in my life. And the first one came with a friend of mine, Luke. And Luke and I met in graduate school, and we were both working on separate doctoral degrees at the time. And we had a friend group that we would regularly go out to dinner. And I noticed when it came to ordering meals, everyone would order a meal except for Luke. He would sit off, drink a water, and then wait till the end. And he knew that there would be enough leftovers on everybody's plates to where he could just kind of clean up and fill up. And we've all been there. We've all done that. But it became a pattern. And the more I noticed this, the more I, it became a little bit of a place of annoyance for me. Like, hey, man, we're all in graduate school. We're all broke. But some of us are still ordering food. Until one day, I was sitting down with Luke, and he began to open up about a low point that he had been through in his life. And he told me about a time when he was five years old, and he had two younger sisters And his dad was convicted of a white-collar crime and sent off to jail for several years. And his mother was left with these three little kids and no one and nothing to go off of. And at that age, he remembered playing a game of who could find the best food in the trash can. And the siblings would spread out to the different trash cans and bring back whatever food that they found. And they would share in it with the family. And when he shared that with me, just like that, My perspective, my attitude was changed. And I went from a place of annoyance to a place of great compassion and understanding. The second low point conversation I had was with this friend Catherine. And Catherine is a 60-something African-American woman. She's so full of life and so full of joy and this incredible woman. And she was a part of a book club that my wife and I hosted at our house last summer. So every week, people would read a few of the chapters, and they would come over to our house, we'd serve them a meal, and we'd get into conversation. And over the weeks, the conversations would grow deeper and deeper, and Catherine began to open up and share of some of these tragedies that she had been through as a little child, experiencing things that, quite frankly, no one should ever have to experience. And then one night, she got to a place where she looked over at my wife and I, and she opened up about how transformational this group had been. And how important it was to be invited into our house, served a meal, and develop a friendship with the two of us. Because she said, for the majority of my life, the only reason I would have ever been invited over to a white professor's house would be to clean it. It's those kinds of things that change your relationships and change your perspective and your attitude about the very people that are seated right around you. And we need to engage in these kinds of conversations more regularly. But there's multiple hurdles that we have to overcome in this process. And even in having my students engage in these activities, there's two hurdles in particular I have to help them overcome. And quite frankly, it's the same two reasons that you're likely to never have these low-point conversations in your life. And the first one is this. The first one is what I call relational armor. And it looks a little bit something like this guy here, where he's got the sunglasses on, the cell phone in his hand, the earbuds going up. Oftentimes, there might be a coffee cup in one hand and a bag over the other shoulder. And what that does is that it puts up this relational armor that keeps us at a distance from those closest to us. It sends out this signal of that we're emotionally unavailable. And I wrote about this recently, and a woman wrote back to me, about an experience she had with this very idea. She said, I had just paid for this trip for a friend of mine, and my friend has this estranged son that she hasn't spoken to, she hasn't seen in over two years, and I wanted to do this nice, kind gesture for her. So I paid for her trip, and I even went along with her to show emotional support. And while I was there with her and her estranged son that she hadn't seen in over two years, in observation... I realized that for half the time she was there, she was on her phone. She realized in that moment that relational armor is an equal opportunist and blind to all. When we get into the tunnel vision on our phone, everything else flies into the emotional blind spots of life. And it becomes out of sight, out of mind for the people that are closest to us. It doesn't matter if it's your estranged son, your favorite aunt, Brad Pitt, or Oprah Winfrey. 
If they fall into that blind spot emotionally, they're out of sight and out of mind. And in the words of Oprah Winfrey, when it comes to relational armor, you get ignored, you get ignored, everybody gets ignored. Therapist Zach Brittle said that technology invites us to avoid intimacy and we gladly accept the invitation. We see an opportunity to connect here, but instead we go here. We avoid the connection of those closest to us to a safety device. I recently was parking on campus, and as I was parking, I noticed this older gentleman parking nearby. And it's a guy that I look up to and I admire, and I was excited to see him and to catch up with him. And as I got out of my car, I looked over at him getting out of his, and he was covered in relational armor. He had the cell phone, the earbuds, the sunglasses, a hat, a bag, and the thought that came to mind for me was, it's not worth it. It's not worth it. And I turned and walked away. Think about how many times people have seen us from a short distance away, wearing our own relational armor or on our phone, and thought about us. It's not worth it. And they turned and walked away. Because when we're wearing this relational armor, we might as well be wearing this, a full bodysuit, keeping us at a distance from all those around us. And people know this, and they use it that way intentionally. I've talked with so many people that will outright admit that they'll see a familiar face coming down the walkway, and they'll actually pretend to text or pretend to fake, to fake a phone call so that they don't have to have that small talk conversation. And Susan Scott said that not, not every single conversation is guaranteed to change the trajectory of a life a relationship, or a career. Yet any single conversation can. Relational armor leads us to lose sight of that idea. The second reason you're likely to never have these low-point conversations is because the majority of people have keyboard courage and face-to-face -face fears. Behind a keyboard, they are confident and they're assertive. But task them with saying the same very things to somebody's face, and they wimp out. The more that we take the keyboard path of least resistance, the harder it becomes to take the face-to-face -face path with resistance. And we're in a place in society where author Tom Mercer said that today people are hungrier for relationships than they've ever been, yet more afraid of them. I do research on missed opportunities for conversations, times where people saw an opportunity to connect with someone and instead walked away. And these aren't even avoiding saying negative interactions. These are what we call positive withholds, where they have something positive to contribute, yet withhold it. Two examples of this, one comes from a woman that was a part of this volunteering group, and they created these essential bags for the homeless. And she said, when we got downtown and I stepped off the bus and I saw this homeless gentleman across the way, I couldn't even overcome the social discomfort to give my bag away to anyone. She put together this care package but couldn't even bring herself to give it away. And another young girl, she said that she was a part of this youth group. And in this youth group, there was another young girl that always sat in the back. And she was physically present but emotionally disengaged. And recently she said she found out that that young girl was pregnant. She said her heart broke for her and went out to her. And she wanted nothing more than at the end of this meeting to go over there and tell her that as long as she was a part of that group, she would always be cared for, always be supported, and never be alone. But when the meeting came to an end, she couldn't bring herself to overcome that social discomfort. And instead she turned and made small talk with the person next to her. Here, this young pregnant girl has an opportunity to leave that meeting feeling connected, supported, and encouraged, and instead, she leaves feeling as disconnected and isolated as ever. Author Mark Batterson said that his job is to do two things. One, to comfort the afflicted, and two, to afflict the comfortable. 
I love that motto, and I've since adopted it as a professor. That my job as a professor is to do two things, to afflict to to comfort the afflicted and to afflict the comfortable. And my job specifically today is to afflict the comfortable so that you all go out and comfort the afflicted. And I know that that can seem like a big task and a big challenge when we think about everyone and all the low points and all the burdens and all of the needs. But here's the refreshing reality provided by Richard Evans when he said that we can't do everything for everyone everywhere, but we can do something for someone somewhere. Don't get focused on everyone, everywhere. Get focused on someone, somewhere. During this talk, you might have had a name or a face that's been popping into your head. That's your someone, somewhere that you need to reach out to and connect with. And I was so encouraged by a student that wrote to share a success story of this. And he said one Sunday evening, he was leaving his church. And outside of his church is a cafe. And as he was walking out of that cafe, he saw a girl out of the corner of his eye sitting at this table, all alone with a sad expression on her face and a tear rolling down her cheek. He said she was surrounded by people, but no one was interacting with her. He said, my natural first impulse was to avoid and to walk away, but as soon as I took that first step away, I knew I had to go back. So he walked up to her table, and he said, hey, do you mind if I sit down with you here? She looked up at him and said, no, it's fine. He sat down with her. He said, well, do you mind if I ask you what's on your mind? She looked at him with tears in her eyes and said, to be totally honest, I'm contemplating committing suicide right now. And he sat there with her for over an hour, hearing her story, hearing the secret history of this young girl's pain and suffering. He gave her a ride home and made her pinky promise not to take her own life that night. We can't do everything for everyone, everywhere, but we can do something for someone, somewhere. That's your task and your challenge today. When you wake up in the morning, don't get focused on everyone, everywhere. Get focused on that someone, somewhere. Look for the occasional opportunity to have your head up, your relational armor down, and find that someone, somewhere that you were meant to connect with, that you were meant to encourage, or maybe just simply acknowledge their presence. But don't miss your chance and your opportunity to shift from a place of certainty about people to a place of curiosity about people. To shift from a place of jumping to conclusions about people to jumping into people's stories. And I guarantee if you do, you will find yourself regularly shifting from a place of annoyance to a place of great compassion for people. Thank you.